Hey guys, welcome back for another video. Today we're taking a look at this new CarPlay Dash system from, I think it's called Euchi. <laughs> anyway, that's what we're gonna call it. We're gonna unbox it real quick, go through what you get. We're gonna set it up and install it on my FJR 1300, go through anything weird we find in there, go through all the features, then we're gonna take it out on the road for day and nighttime tests so we can test the dash cams because this does come with them. This one I have high hopes for. If you've noticed, I've done a series of reviews of these types of systems. This is the last one I have planned. In a couple days, the buyer's guide is gonna go up so you can directly compare all the important features and whatnot so you can decide which is best for you. But this one, on paper at least, looks like a really great value. Let's take a look. Now, all that being said, I already know that on paper doesn't really mean anything. We have to check out the results. I wanna see the camera quality, see the responsiveness of the unit, see if it dims in bright light and high heat, all that kind of good stuff. We have a manual right here on top. I said it before, these aren't terribly important. It's always good to read through them just because sometimes there's one weird little thing that you would never pick up on. And sometimes there are specific instructions, for example, pairing tire pressure monitoring systems, which we do have, by the way. Very good to see that. Anyway, I'll keep that for reference, but here we have the unit itself. It is a six inch model. The standard, pretty much iPhone size, the large iPhone. The tire pressure monitors are the in-between size. They're not the latest and greatest super small ones, but they're not the old gen big and heavy. I still wouldn't use these on rubber. I suggest you get metal valve stems if you want to run these or the old style. Only the newest super small, super light ones I would run on rubber. But these have proven to be very reliable, so good to see those. We have bullet style cams, standard Sony sensors. But as I mentioned to somebody else, the cameras alone don't tell the whole story. The processing of the camera signal is what makes the big difference. I've reviewed multiple units using the same cameras and they have different results because what's in here is different. The processor itself and the software running it. We've got the little arrow there indicating up and they're the smallish bullet style. So should be at least giving good odds for a good picture. And they do have plastic screw on mounts. The unit itself here, and I believe we've seen another one of these very similar in another review. Screwing connections for front rear camera and power. We have a built-in GPS. That's important for a couple things. One, it saves battery power on your phone. If you're using CarPlay or Android Auto and you're doing navigation and you don't have GPS built into the unit, then it's powered by your phone's GPS, which drains its battery faster. So by putting it on board, you're running off your bike power and just saving your battery on your phone a little bit. And as I've mentioned before, none of these are quick detachable. So they are made to mount on the bike. You can't just detach them from a mount or anything. And on the top here, we have some mounting screws. I'm not sure what those are for. And on the bottom, we have the standard plastic cover where we have the SD card and a USB port for diagnostics and everything on the bottom and no hard buttons. Got this guy stuck in here pretty good. And this is cracked and broken it appears to be unused the unit itself looks brand new nice screen protector on there Ooh, is that a break or is that gunk ah oh, good that's gunk man that looked just like a little chip <laughs> no just some glue from the screen protector or whatever Cool. Bezels are normal, about a half an inch, but you would expect underneath here. I expect to see some wires and maybe tools. And here's our, yeah, these are the same as the Chiggy. You get these locking nuts for the tire pressure monitoring. And then these caps here. I think the Speedle used these. I'm not sure I've done so many of them, but that's for 
gripping here and undoing these, which I will be doing to measure the battery voltage because so far all of them come with low or depleted batteries. So we'll double check that before we do the install. And then in here we've got, oh, hate to see that. These are the same brackets. I can't remember the brand now. Uh, Carper Ride, I think it was, where I absolutely hated the mounts. Well, we got another one same ones i think they're even smaller but it's the same single-sided bent up yeah they are smaller single-sided bent up tab i'll show you when i pull these out these are absolutely terrible and uh you're gonna want to do something else with your mounts but we'll go through that nothing new unfortunately i've already gone through all that we have a remote control very cool it is wireless and again there's there's some mounting screws on here maybe you can Put a bar clamp on it. We'll have to see what else is in here. Can't feel if the buttons are rubber. Let me take it out real quick. It's got a real good tactile click to it. They are rubber. Very nice. White lettering. That's interesting that they put the icons horizontal so that you're meant to mount the remote like this instead of like that. But you could do it either way. We've got a play phone. Again, that looks like a refresh. I know different brands have called it different things. And a camera, and then a video camera and a lock. So multiple features here. Got a little tiny speck of green light showing on there and then a blue. No, they're all blue. Got a bracket here. I would imagine that is for probably the remote. And then we've got the standard bar clamp. This is a plastic unit and I'm hoping there's something else that can go on the back so I can easily mount a Ram ball. We'll take a look. Ah, so here's the actual unit that goes on the back. Pretty similar to another design we've seen with these toothed interfaces. But this gives me hope because it is removable, so I could probably mount a ball on that. Shouldn't be that big of a deal. And then what's this? Ah, well that explains the top three screw holes. We've got a sunshade. That's very cool. First one I've seen that's removable. So that can go on top of the unit and give yourself a little sunshade. Very nice. And then we have the power cord. I need to double check. Yes, the rear camera does have an extra long cord, so no extension. It is one big long cable. And then the power cord itself. Let me just take a look at the wires here real quick. Standard screw on and inline fuse. Yeah, these are new. So I had to check and see if anybody had screwed these down. Nope, all new. Okay. That's what we get in the box. Pretty straightforward. I'm excited. Let's get it installed. First step, I want to mount it here. So let's see how to attach a Ram ball. And I'm happy to say the mount that comes with it is perfectly straight, standard adjustable. You do get all these different positions. You can put it on a bar any which way you like. It has built-in anti-vibration little bushings in it. And this simply connects to here with these four little screws. So if you are mounting to a bar, you are all set. Works just fine out of the box. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this piece here and see what we can work with with the center hole to put in a ball. And as I did in a, another review, we can screw on standard Ram ball. I'll put a link down to this particular part. Now I would go to the store and get a slightly, I mean just like quarter inch longer screw to go through there because the ball usually sits down in, but it doesn't fit down in the slot made for the standard bracket. So it is up a little higher, but that's all you need there. It's biting on, yeah, let's say about 75% of the threads in there. Good enough th for the review, but like I said, just hit the hardware store, get yourself a slightly longer screw just for safety there. And there we go. Just use a standard short ram connector. And that looks perfect. Let's go ahead and throw in the sunshade. And that goes on with three very small Phillips screws, and they do give you an extra. Love to see that. Now, let's take a look at the bottom, open this cover up, and see if they give us a card. 
And just to confirm, they are not the same screws as the top. The longer one is for the three on top and they are not captured. So do not lose any of these screws. And then underneath we have a metal bar, no problem popping that right off. And then two individual rubber gaskets and they do not include a card. That's a USB-C on the right and an empty card slot on the left. So again, I'll put a link down below to a great card that I suggest that I use. Now we're gonna open up the tire sensors and measure the batteries. We're looking for 3.3 to 3.4 volts for a nice fresh battery. You get down to three or below and they will usually glitch out or stop working. So let's see how fresh they are. And they're using CR1632 cells just for confirmation. First one is dead on at 3.0. So it'll probably work for the review, but its days are done. And the same for the second one, 3.02, 3.03. And take it from me, when you're buying these kinds of cells, no matter what they're for, whether they're for these sensors or your car fobs, smart home stuff, remotes, etc., buy the name brand. Buy the Duracell or the Energizer. Do not go with the cheap brands. Don't even go with the Amazon Basics. I've tried them all. All of them except the major name brands self deplete so fast. I just threw out half an entire sheet of these because I bought a big bulk of them. I don't remember the name brand. It was like Tico or something like that. You know, something cheap on Amazon. It was a third of the price of the name brand. And I only got through two batteries before everything was toast because just sitting in the drawer in the package, they self depleted. The Energizers, I had one left from six years ago and it was still 3.35. Now, even though I really don't like these mounts, and I'll show you exactly why in a second here, I do like that they give you not only one, but two adhesive stickers for them, and they're not pre-applied, so you don't have to waste them if you're looking for the right mount or you want to use your own sticker or anything like that. That's very nice. Now, here's the crux of the problem. So the way they work is you have your collar, and it just fits in that groove, and it pinches it, right? So that is as close, that is as tight as this can physically close because it's tight around the camera. Notice how big that gap is. Notice how thin the ear is that goes in the gap. This one is better than the last one, but even cranked down. All you're doing is squishing those little ears together. You're bending the two ears on the camera side to try and pinch the other gear ear. So, I mean, it stays, it's better than the last one that actually had a gap, but it's still movable. So if something hits it, there's a really strong wind or rain or whatever, it can still move. And if you crank it down anymore, you strip the threads. So barely adequate is what I would say this mount is. You'll definitely want to engineer something better yourself. For power, they're using standard red and black for power and yellow for accessory. And we're connected to the fuse box. Got our front camera installed and the rear. Now, I'm not super hiding the wires just for the review. I'll put a link down below to an extensive wiring adventure I had doing a total stealth install on the FJR if you want to see that. Okay, time for first boot up. Let's take a look, see how long it takes, run through all the features. That's cool. What does it say? Caradar? I have no clue. <laughs> Makes a little chime noise there. Notice memory card error. Please set the. Yeah, it's a brand new card in there, so I'm going to format that first. Fairly responsive there. Where should I go? Remote language time, phone, audio. I'm looking for like system card anything what am i looking for whoa okay so it automatically goes back to the home page or it was super sensitive where can i get into the card we get a nice bar shaped recording sensor there i would imagine it would be under here key volume so it's making a noise here while i'm tapping stuff i'll turn that off because that's annoying remote key what's in there oh that's to pair the wireless remote. That's fine. I guess we'll just go through stuff here. English, time setting. I'll just leave it. It's not really important for the review. 
phone pairing. I will do that in a bit here. Wi-Fi switch, that's probably for downloading your uh, files to the app. Tire pressure setup, I haven't done that yet. You can set the high and low alarm. And again, we've seen the same menu in another unit. Screensaver, very good to see that. Although it's just a standard timer, it's still not, there, there may be a button somewhere in here yet, but it's still not dedicated screen on off. So this to me isn't terribly useful. Like I said before, when you're, oh, and I hate that. When you're in navigation, you do not want your screensaver coming on. So off while you're using navigation, but I would like it on when I'm playing music. Going into a setting to switch stuff like that, that's not ideal. Let's go through the settings here. So we don't have auto brightness, but we do have a very responsive slider here. We'll just keep it on full. It's perfectly, this screen actually looks more saturated and brighter than the settings. This looks great. Nice deep blacks, very high res, no problems with that at all. So here's CarPlay and Android Auto to get into that. I'll set that up after I'm done here. Panel, what's in here? Oh, that's cool. So that gives you a, and it's big enough to read too. You get a nice digital speedometer. We'll have to set the unit of measures. I love that you see the tire pressures right there. This would be a very nice screen to keep up if you're not using navigation. So if you're just playing music and boom, you got some cool stuff here and you got a compass. That's another thing the built-in GPS gives you. Very cool, and you've got elevation here. I'm in the garage, so the GPS hasn't connected anything yet. It's still showing zero meters. I know that's a little mountain symbol. Made that mistake once. <laughs> Let's see, what else we got? GPS info, should be satellite connections, and it's zero. That's expected. Let's go back home. Drive recorder, that is your dash cam playback. Here's our two cameras, and they are squished. Okay, I actually like that when you're is that straight? Well, that's a bummer. As another one that I got in, the vertical markers on the physical cameras are not accurate. I'm on the center stand on the bike. It's perfectly straight, and the verticals on both the cameras are right at the top. But obviously, the front even more so. They're both twisted a little bit, so I'll fix that. But let's see how we go to a single... It was a swipe, there we go. It was a swipe on the last one. So there's the rear, here's the front. Yeah, definitely a misalignment on the assembly there. As we've seen before, not a huge deal. What's in settings for cameras? We can set our resolution, 1080p is our full. Loop recording time, large chunks please. Easier for me to edit. This is a G sensor, so it'll automatically lock if your bike crashes or gets hit. It'll lock that clip. This is if you want the date shown on your videos. This is if you want your GPS information, your speed and your coordinates, and if you want to record the audio or not. Audio on these, uh, there's a mic on the bottom of the unit. It can be useful if you're behind a windscreen, but even at speed behind a windscreen, it just turns into like So it's not terribly useful. It doesn't take up hardly any space. So there's really no reason not to record it unless you specifically don't want to record it. This is your stop and start, take a snapshot, lock the clip, record audio or not, loop, go back home. Still looking for uh, how to format the card. <laughs> it's gotta be in settings, right? It's gotta be. Oh wait, do we have another screen? Ah, oh, I hate that, I hate that. Was that there before? Were these little ones there before? Wait a minute, am I going crazy? No, they weren't. Look at that, I hate that. That's bad software design. I know that AOE, uh, AOGE, sorry, doesn't have any control of that, but that is poor design. I made that mistake before where I didn't know another screen was there and I had to swipe from the side. Oh, I hate that. That's gotta be a setting to turn that off. But look at that, you don't know there's another screen there, but if you start to scroll, oh, now it's not there. Maybe just, oh, there we go. So it was, not quite picking up my finger and it leaves a little mark. But anyway, you get the gist of it. You got another row here. GPS info again, format, there we go. Yes, please format the card. Factory reset and checking your firmware. 
All right, and I believe we should have an app dedicated to downloading stuff. I'll install that and I'll let you know at the end of this, after I go through some editing and actually have used it, what that's like, if there's any gotchas with it. Other than that, I'm gonna go ahead and connect CarPlay real quick and then we'll go into that and see what it adds for our CarPlay experience. And CarPlay connected, no problem, nice and fast. So here's our home screen. Anytime you have a device that connects to your CarPlay, I believe Android Auto too, there's gonna to be a custom icon that takes you back to the home page of whatever the device you're on. So that takes us home. And then it also adds a quick menu here. That's what that little circle is. So we have another button to go home. What is the volume? So it's the actual volume of the unit. That's handy if you're connecting via Bluetooth to like speakers on your motorcycle. But other than that, it's not used for our purposes. And we've got shortcut to the dash cams. Go back into CarPlay. And then the last one should be brightness. Yeah, quick to the brightness. Now, interestingly, there's lag. It doesn't change the brightness until I pull up my finger. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just something to note. So I'll just leave it on full again. Now let's try and see how fast music pops in on title here. It's interesting that the vertical resolution is squished a little bit. Usually I see both rows of this on uh, just about any car play. We've got normal width. It's kind of like a five inch unit that they just cropped off a little bit. Even though it's a six inch diagonal, you're not getting the full resolution of most five inch units, but that popped in just, fat, just fine, totally fast. About a normal delay here. This isn't always terribly quick. That's about normal. So let's try Apple Maps. That is perfectly fine. See if we have two finger for pinch and zoom. Hey, I didn't touch it. <laughs> Do we? It's hard to tell. Let me get back to something. Can't see anything. The GPS isn't connecting, so it doesn't know where I am. All right, let me just try zooming. No, I think it's just trying to move around with one of my fingers. That's fine. Most don't have two finger. Perfectly usable, no problem whatsoever. This is really cool. This is what I was hoping for. Now, if the camera quality looks good, this one is gonna be a top contender. Let me tell you what, for 200 bucks and this kind of performance so far? Yeah, buddy. All right, let's take it out on the road. Before we take off, I forgot to show you how to pair the tire pressure sensors. All I did is hit the pair button it flashes, you screw on the front one, automatically goes to the second, and bing, bang, boom. There, my CarPlay Auto connected. Let's go for the daytime ride. Okay, it is another hot and bright, sunny, beautiful Florida day. We're gonna do a daytime test here. We're gonna be looking for how the unit looks. I'm gonna stay out for an extended period of time because it does have this sun shield. I don't know if it has to do with overheating. I think it's just glare which you may or may not need. I haven't noticed a problem with it on any other units. So if I was keeping this on the bike, I wouldn't probably use it. It's up to you. And of course, we're gonna be taking a look at front and rear dash cam quality. This is kind of a torture test right here that I like to go through. We've got bright sunny skies. Wanna see how it's exposing for the clouds, deep dark shadows here in the trees, all kinds of high data detail the tree leaves the asphalt want to look for pixelation how it's handling all this fast motion this is as good as you're going to get for a torture test and of course we're going to look at the rear camera it'll be especially evident at night if they're putting more processing power to the front or if they're equal but sometimes it shows up during the day i'll tell you though if uh, I haven't seen the editing yet, this isn't my first ride out with it, but I still haven't seen the actual raw footage. If it looks good, this thing is going to be an absolute steal of a deal. So just touching around the unit here, this is the home screen. 
The only things that I find a little difficult are with gloves on hitting these small buttons. There's nothing in this about touch sensitivity or enhanced area touch or anything like that. So it is what it is. But all the big buttons, no problem whatsoever. And you can see very nice and responsive. The navigation, completely usable. Obviously the GPS connected now that I'm out of the garage. Nice and instant and fast, just like anything else. Now, no complaints there. And it did automatically set some of the data by the GPS. I noticed it's now showing the correct day and everything. So that's cool. First helps. Got these new boots on and I am not used to the exact way they fit and feel quite yet. <laughs> So I'm gonna hit this road for a good 15 minutes, up and down, up and down, keeping the sun directly on the unit here. And we're going to do our best to heat it up and see if we've got any kind of dimming. So far it's been a mixed bag of units that do and don't do it. So it's not like it's a given one way or the other. Let me go back to the home screen here. I really like this dashboard panel screen. It's quite usable. Number one, at least right now, it's nice and bright. So it is instantly readable to see not only the speedo number in the middle, and because I have it mounted so close to me, it's about the same size as the speedo readout on my dash. So it gives that equal amount of attention. I absolutely love seeing the tire pressure, <laughs> tire pressure and temperature. Very useful data. This would be a great screen to pop up. You know, if you're just cruising down the road, you've just got your music on autoplay, you don't need to see what song's playing, and you know you got a long stretch of highway or something, and you don't need your navigation up. Boom, there you go, instant little speedo. Of course, I would always appreciate a button to turn the screen off. That's about the only big thing missing. It's not a deal breaker for everybody, but that is definitely a plus that they could add. Just a button somewhere, maybe just on the home screen to, you know, put the screen to sleep. That's all you need. That would be awesome and very simple to do, I would think, in firmware. Let's go to the full screen dash cam view. It's also a little hard to hit this back button with gloves on. It doesn't always want to register. It seems to be a small area and I'm just not sure where it is. It's definitely not the whole icon. So here we can see our rear view camera, full screen. Note it also does remember what screen you had this on. So that's really handy. It doesn't default to the split screen. The rear is what I had it on last time I was out. So that's really cool to see. Now I need to confirm, I'll put a notice up here on the screen one way or the other. If it has image stabilization, it's hard for me to tell here because the unit is kind of bouncing around, but it does appear to have it. And I saw one marketing blip, one little blurb on the product page that said something about stabilization. So I believe it has it, but I'll double check. I'll know from the editing most likely, <laughs> and I'll double check the manual again to see if it says anything about it. Now one odd thing, and I have no idea why it does this, at first I thought this counter up here with the red blinking record light was obviously how long it's been recording. It is not. For some reason, that just shows how far into the current clip time you are. So I've got the loop recording set to five minute chunks and this resets after five minutes. It threw me the first time because I, I looked down, it said, I don't know, two or three minutes, something like that. And then a few minutes later, I looked back down and it was only three or four minutes. I'm like, wait a minute, no, I've been out way longer than that. What's going on? And then I, I thought maybe that's what it's doing. So I watched it when it hit five minutes and it flips back to zero. Absolutely useless feature, but at least the red light there lets you know it's recording. No idea why anyone thought that was a needed kind of counter though. So let's head out on the road here, get behind this car and we'll do some standard distances. See how it reads plates. This will be the biggest difference between a non-stabilized and a stabilized sensor or camera is how well during high vibration, which usually means high speed, you're gonna be able to make out fine details. Let's get behind this guy here. 
get up to speed a little bit. I'm about three car lengths behind him right now. This is about my limit of where I can clearly read the plate. So here's 60 miles an hour. Here's two car lengths and one. Just to be clear, it's only bouncing around like this because I got mounted so high up off the bars. Number one, it's near the bar end. It's on a mount that's on my clutch reservoir. Plus I've got the ram ball extension and then onto the ram ball that I added and then the anti-vibration mount. So there's a lot of input for vibration by the time it reaches this device. If you're mounting down here on the stem, you can see this one down here just mounted direct hardly moving at all so what you get like this you're gonna get it with any kind of device if you stick this much in between and you'll have a better time the more sturdy you can mount it no matter what you buy all right well the great news is I cannot get this thing to dim at all I've been out this is my third ride out with it been out for 15 20 minutes on each ride doesn't dip a bit and I really don't think it has anything to do with the sun shield because I've had it where the sun is directly into it, directly at my back, directly at the front. It just doesn't care. So thumbs up there. The only question remaining is how does this footage look? Now we're gonna do a night test just to make sure that looks good. And then in a couple days, my buyer's guide goes up for all these dash units that I've been reviewing. And I'll add to it if I get any more in the future. But I can already tell you, if the footage is good, man, this thing is going to be the standout value winner. It's giving you a good 80%, if not more, of the features and quality of the Chiggy at less than a third of the cost. I believe I've got a discount code, I'll put it down below if I do, that would bring this under $200 with everything, with both cameras, with the tire pressure monitoring, it's gonna be an absolute sellout, let me tell you that. All right, time for the night ride. Oh, and by the way, this has no problem at all being on fully switched power in the fuse box, just like the Chiggy. Boots up, no problem. I can already tell the brightness is gonna be way too high here at night. There's no auto brightness. So let's see, that right there. Just matching my dashboard by eye. That looks pretty good right about there. Somewhere around 10, 15 percent. About what the other one that I manually adjusted was. I don't remember which brand that was. Let's check the main screen. Yeah, that looks fine. Not distracting at all. Let's bring up the dash cams. I love how it remembers what last camera you were on. I'll just leave it on rear, that's fine. So for this night test, besides checking the brightness there, we are going to be checking out the camera quality, front and rear. I'm going to go through some dark sections, some well-lit sections, then we'll go out on the highway, see if we can read any plates or not. It is very hard for most dash cams, even really good ones, to read plates at night because of the glare, the reflections off the plate itself and all that kind of good stuff. So that's not a make or break deal for any dash cam in my opinion. If it ends up being very readable, well, that's just a nice bonus. So as we go through here, check out the front camera quality, check out the rear camera quality. This will be the for sure indicator if they're giving processing priority to front or if they're equal. We've had a mix in the various systems that have been tested. Not a huge deal again. I would definitely say if you need to put processing power to the front to get great coverage, go ahead and do that and sacrifice a little bit of the rear. Now at night, I'm gonna say that that green light, I'm not sure what it's indicating. I think it's just 
everything's good, I would put a little bit of black tape over that because that is pretty darn bright. <laughs> it's twice as bright as everything else at night and my eye just catches it. It's not, you know, glaring in my face or anything like that, but it is a little distracting. So we'll go through this parking lot here that's very well lit at night. I think they still have some floodlights on too. So that'll be the best case scenario for nighttime recording. Huh. Still working on the power and everything here at night. The regular lights are off, but the floodlights are on. That's good enough. So we'll check this out. Shouldn't be a thing, anything unusual. The screen looks absolutely phenomenal. I mean, there's no pixelation. There's no noise. I mean, it looks like broadcast TV. If the footage coming off the card is just as good, oh man, that's going to be impressive. And I'm looking at the rear camera. Alright, let's wait for a car to go here. So I can get behind it. See what the light's doing. Here we go. See, look at this rear view. This is why I love having this up when I'm at lights. Just making sure that car is slowing down as it's approaching me. I'm watching in the mirrors too, but you get a much better angle from a camera. Let me tell you that. Man, I can't get over how good that picture looks. All right, let's go catch this guy. Here's three car lengths. Headlights are coming off the plate. Here's two. And one. All right, so far it's looking like a hit. Let me get into editing and I'll give you my final thoughts here and wrap this review up. This thing is cool. This is by far the value leader. It is a solid second place in overall quality and features. This is gonna be a hit. I can wholeheartedly say that if you got 200 bucks and you need any of this functionality, this is the one to get, plain and simple. So a couple things I found out, there is no image stabilization. That being said, the cameras, depending on how you mount them, they're gonna be nice no matter what. Now, the reason I thought it had stabilization is because there's a marketing blurb and it's a little bit of chinglish. They were talking about the anti-vibration on the back of the mount for the unit, not the cameras. And at first I thought I was wrong about it having an app. I could have sworn I saw a marketing blurb about there being an app. Nothing in the manual, nothing. There's no barcode to download it, not even a name of an app. I mean, nothing, even on their webpage. I found a little marketing picture of a mobile app showing playback of a saved file. So I took a chance and I tried Vidur, that third party dash cam app that most of these original manufacturers use. Ta-da, it worked. Like other ones that I've reviewed, you do have to turn off CarPlay manually in your phone. I would assume Android Auto is the same, but maybe not. And then you can connect to its Wi-Fi and then you can fire up the gear and download your stuff. And because it has the built-in GPS, you can optionally in the app show all kinds of overlay just like this. So it's really cool. In the app, you see the real-time data and everything and there's also a map below it. So really nice stuff there. Man, I got a discount code. I'll put it down below. Takes the thing under 200 bucks. Absolute freaking steal of a deal. Um, the files, they're just under 100 megabytes per minute record time per camera. And it transferred pretty fast. To, it took about a minute and a half on my phone here. And it's in H.264. So not that big of a deal to work with either. That's it. Hope it helps. Stay tuned for the buyer's guide just in case you're looking to compare. If this isn't the one for you, maybe you can find something else. We'll see you next time.